So the, the purpose of this last part of the afternoon is going to be just to show a few uh, ways that you could, or so, sort of a few tools to do the kind of things that let me and Dylan were talk about, talking about on Signet. It's, so it'll be Signet specific, but a lot of it carries over, if not everything. Um, and some of it, if you're familiar with a bit of batch scripting or something, it's going to look very familiar. It's more the context of, hey, this is what you have right there to organize your data or to uh, find things in your data. Yes. So we're going to talk about a couple, a couple of uh, command line tools, basically useful little bash or Linux commands that, uh, that can help you out. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about version control as well, uh, how that could be useful, um, what, what the basis of it is. Has anybody used version control here? Yeah, that's good. All right. So that should be fairly straightforward. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about specifics of Cynet in terms of storage limits and how to keep track of them. Uh, we'll look at compressing data uh, in case you run into storage limits. Uh, limits. Uh, how to move data and we'll talk a bit about uh, file formats and, and uh, briefly about metadata, but in the same sort of uh, descriptive data, data about your data rather than uh, a fixed uh, sort of schema of uh, what you should know about your data. So we heard about uh, the philosophy of data and the data life, life cycle, retention, preservation, sharing, documentation, file format, uh, version control. And so that, that's really, in that context, we're going to look at, at a couple of uh, useful tools. There's no one tool. This is more of a toolbox, uh, which makes sense that if you had one tool, it would probably not do exactly what you wanted anyway. Um, so a lot of them are command line tools. So we're, we're going to assume you're on Cynet. Uh, you don't have to follow along. We're going to assume that this is all taking place at Cynet. You have your bash prompt. Remember, our, our Linux shell is called bash. And uh, what can we do? So I'm going to, for this little part, look at a rather messy file structure. And it's in a well uh, self documented uh, uh, directory name called my research. And so I might want to play around with this. So I. Anyway, is everyone familiar with Linux shell? Yeah. Someone that is not too familiar with this. There it is, my research. So the first thing, suppose this was uh, inherited data that I would do, is I would type in ls. <laughs> if you haven't guessed that this is a bit of a messy uh, thing, it's not that bad. It's just somebody's doing something on a file system right now, I'm sure, that makes it's this more worse than this. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what was supposed to happen is something like this. By the way, this also contributes, if you had a humongous amount of files in one directory, contribute to this kind of situation. Okay? So that's another reason why at least in the high performance right. yes. centers it is it's not it. a good idea to have go. a lot of files. So I've got a lot of files. They have names. I can read most of them. Analysis 1, 2, run, in, out, text. Not quite sure what they all mean, but they're, they're there. Um, so suppose I wanted to, suppose this is my data. It is probably uh, data that came out of not having a very uh, well-described uh, research uh, data management plan, but uh, Oh, here it is. So we'll first look at kind of how you would find your way around here, right? Around and, and make some sense of it, uh, and, and maybe then start organizing better. So I'm going to throw at you a couple of Linux commands that some of you might know and other might not, and I hope at least one or two are new for you. Uh, a very versatile and underused utility is fine. Uh, it does what it says, it finds files, uh, and it does it kind of in a, you give it a, essentially a query. So you tell find to find anything with the name of this structure, like star.log. 
What Fine does above just uh, an LS of the same kind would be that it goes into the directory stru structure. So it finds anything that is of that pattern anywhere in the tree. You can give other uh, attributes too. You can say that you want it to be of a certain type. You can tell it to uh, do only files that are owned by you, say. Uh, there's a bunch of different query uh, queries that you can give, uh, but the name is by, by far, of course, the most, most commonly used. This is why you want a decent uh, naming scheme, even if you have uh, uh, a lot of files, so that you can sort of give it a pattern. Okay, you want everything that had to do with temperature, then temperature star should give me, for instance, right? Very useful, and we'll see, you could, you could actually sort of chain that too. So you can find all the log files. But even if you find those files, since we don't know what they are per se, they just have some random name, uh, it, this is a, a useful little command called file. It's an actual command. And it'll tell you what kind of file it is. So if I do file on the name of a file, so, such as runs.log, it'll tell me, well, it's an ASCII text. So ASCII is basically just plain plain text using only common English letters and some, uh, some punctuation. Um, Whereas file previous says that previous is a directory. So if you so if you just have the name, it will also tell you if something is say, and I have that example is a an executable, whether it's binary, uh, whether it's a shell script, a Python script. You might be able to detect that too, um, and it does that fairly efficiently. You could of course open the file, but if you don't know what it is, then you might actually open some open some sort of binary file and uh, your text editor craps out on you. And, it's a, it's a neat little utility for exploring. But suppose you know that it's a, a text file, then you probably want to check out what's in it. And so cat is the easiest way to get the, the content out. You just type cat in the name and you get what, what it is. Um, so these are apparently very small files, these in files, uh, project mouse number equals those equals. If I had to guess, I would say these are input files of some sort, um, but we have no README or anything like that, so we, don't, we can't quite be sure. Another useful little command is WC, which is we stands for word count, but to count count uh, words or characters or lines of a text file, and that can be very useful to find, for instance, how many files there are. Um, but you'd have to combine uh, combine things, so you could combine a find or a name of startup in, and then of that output count how many words there are, which is this WC W. By the way, I'm not going to be giving a complete description of all these comments. If you want to know all it, all their uh, their options and ways of using it, just type man and the, and and the uh, name of the command, and it'll tell you. So what this does is tell us that there are two thousand dot in files in this. Uh, in this directory structure. It sounds like a lot and probably is. And another one that's that can be quite useful, especially if you're trying to keep track of your uh, of part of your data is du. It does disk usage in in a directory. So for instance, if I did a du on this directory, I would find that I have of the order of uh, 64,000 kilobytes in this, happens to be in kilobytes. Um, and about twice as much in the whole directory. It also tells me there is only one subdirectory, that's kind of nice. And uh, th so this is cumulative um, over, over both of them. Now be a little bit careful with DU because it does traverse the whole thing. Uh, so if you start DUing your whole home directory, that's kind of a happy, happy op operation, okay? So if you know you have many files, uh, you're gonna wait for a while, and other users are probably also gonna wait for a while well, the file system figures out what it's doing. So it's not something you use all the time. But if you have a, a subdirectory, you're going, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, or, no, then this could be useful. Okay, so suppose you figured out how much stuff you have, kind of what there is. Um, perhaps there are some things that look to be almost the same. And um, or maybe you made a copy. Um, you saw we have this directory previous. You could imagine there's there's quite a bit of uh, duplication possibly there. Sorry. 
Um, so if you want to know if two files are the same, you could use a comment called diff. And if, in fact, it will, only, it will not only tell you if they're the same, but also where they differ. Uh, so if you weren't very uh, good in doing your version control, uh, you didn't use a version control rules we'll show later, um, you could still figure out from two files, if you kept versions just by copying them, what the difference was by doing diff. And it'll tell, it tells us that uh, line three of one is compared to line three of the other, and then one, the dose was uh, 31,000 something, and the other, the dose was 11,000 something else. Um, useful, but that only works for text files. And it kind of only works for text files because it does a line by line comparison. And the text files basically, in binary files, there's no concept of a line. So uh, it basically would always have a complete line difference. So for binary files, there's CMP compare. And it just prints out whether or not things differ and where they start to differ. So here are two what turn out to be binary files. Uh, one run 0001.out and the other previous slash run 00.n, they actually do, do differ. Um, I don't know anything else about them, but that's, that's what I know. So if I'm exploring my data and I, or, or somebody else's data, I don't know what's going on. This is one way to, to, to get an idea. Another way to kind of get an idea of what's there is ls. Now ls obviously just lists your file. Um, ls-l lists them and a whole bunch of their, what we'd like to call it metadata, although it's, it's, it's really just things like their, uh, their date stamp, uh, who owns it, uh, permissions, etc. So, but the really great thing about this is that you could actually give it a, a more arguments to sort your list. So if I do capital S, it turns out that means sorting by size. So I can figure out which, my large, which are my largest files quite easily by doing an ls dash l capital S. Uh, so, these out, so I could see, okay, which of my binary out files, which are probably the output files, uh, are the largest. Um, and uh, and overhaul, here are the, the top three. It goes on, it doesn't fit on the slide, obviously. There's ways to uh, sort by times. So if you want to know what is the last modified, you do a T rather than S. There's a whole bunch of useful ways of sorting this. Um, but size is especially nice because suppose I did want to know uh, if there's any files that are duplicates, right? Well, one thing that happens with duplicate files is that they have the exact same length, right? So these guys, these three here, happen to have the exact same length. And that's suspicious. It doesn't have to be suspicious. If this is binary data and this is a grid of 100 by 100, then it doesn't matter what's in that grid, they will always have the same size. But if this is something more random, and, and we can see it is because the next out has quite a different size, um, it's a little suspicious. So the first way of figuring out whether something might be the same is by, by just sorting them by, by size. And that sort of comes for free. The file system keeps track of, of, the, of the sizes. I don't have to read this whole file and count how many bytes there are. I just go, oh, this is the number that the file system has stored for me. But I still don't know if they're quite the same. So they're the same size, but maybe they're the same. So I can zoom in even further, although not completely to the solution whether these are the same files, by using something called a checksum. It has other purposes too that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but this MD5sum takes the file and produces a very large number, or really, I don't know what you would call this, it, but it's basically... It's it's basically a hash, yes. So it's, which, which you can think of as a large hexadecimal number. So I took these three files and I ran them through this program called MD5SUM. And it basically reads the whole file and creates a number out of the content of the file. And this number for all three is the same. If they were different, because it reads the file and creates a number out of it, if the number is different, the files must be different somewhere, okay? So, so, so if these happen to be the same size, but have different content, more than likely I would always already find that these are all different. And then it, I'd be done. I wouldn't have to do anything else. I wouldn't have to do a pairwise comparison uh, because I already know they have different checksums. They can't possibly be the same. In this case, however, even their checksums are the same. And at this time, you really have no better option but just start comparing these things. So I compare, run, uh, 0 to 9 with uh, run 0 8 3 0 
and uh, 30 and 31 and 2. Uh, and in, in good Linux fashion, if nothing is said, uh, it is successful. And in this case, successful means uh, they are equal. So these are indeed duplicates. Uh, whether I should remove them is a different question because I have no notes on, on that. But, but I could remove them and leave a note saying, hey, uh, these files were the same. So if you're looking for uh, 029, then you know, just look for this one. Now, this is, a, this is an example of a checksum. This is a pretty decent one. It's nice and long. But it's a number, essentially, derived from the file, file content. So if I copy the file somewhere else, and I didn't do anything to preserve the timestamp, it would seem to be a, a, a file of, of the date that I copied it. So dates aren't really good to distinguish whether files are the same. Um, but, and file names, definitely not, because I can rename files. But the content is. So if I derive a number from the content, that's a great way to do this. It's deterministic. That means the same content leads to the same number. That's why I can use it to distinguish files. Um, however, having the same checksum doesn't guarantee that it's the same content. Because I have many more bytes in that content than there, fit, than there could fit in, uh, in the hash. So it's, it's, it becomes less likely, but it's still possible that they're not the same. So a common use for checksums is to make sure uh, that the files are not different. And so uh, one application of that is if you're copying files or um, doing a backup of files to another system, um, you can make a checksum on the one system. You copy it over, you do a checksum on the other. They better be the same. If they're not the same, you know something went wrong in, in the copying. If they are the same, you're still not guaranteed. But it's now so unlikely that, that it isn't worth your time copying it back and, and, and replacing it. Okay, so it's, it's, a, uh, it's a safety measure. If something goes wrong, in all likelihood, your MD5 sum is different, and you should either copy it again or uh, write to support at Synads and saying my file won't copy properly. Okay, so it's good for, for, for that. But if you really want to know something is the same, there's nothing but comparing. OK, so we've looked at the same as we've looked at finding files. Uh, we can look inside files. We've, we already saw cat. That's, that's how you look into a file. But uh, then there's more and less. I'm sure you've used these. But um, if, the, if the file is very long and it goes out of the screen, then more or less we'll just show a screen at a time. They're not very useful for scripting. Uh, they're not very useful for automating, but they're very useful for exploring. Um, however, what if you want to know all files that have to do with project maps? You could copy them all. You could open them all. You could I can do more and write down on a notepad which ones have project maps. It's obviously not what you want to do. Uh, you want to automate that. And so there's this um, utility called grep that does that. It's, it finds patterns in text files. So again, this, this is text-based. Um, a lot of your metadata descriptions are probably going to be text, so this will work fairly well. Uh, well, uh, code will be in text too, so this is, this is perfectly fine scripts similarly. So given that it seems like these in files are somehow labeled with a project mouse, I'm just going to look for all the star.ins that have project mouse. And when I do that, I get this list with the file name and uh, and the, the matched line. I can add uh, extra arguments to get, say, the line number or just the name of the file or just ways to tweak it. But it looks in all these all these files and says, okay, here are the ones that have mouse. Now, I think in a more ideal setting, all of these mouse ones would be a separate directory called at least called mouse or something with a mouse. Um, I forgot if there's another project, but there are other projects I think there. But this is how you discover this if you don't if you don't know this. Okay, so exploring your data with some some of these tools. Okay, so now we know what's in it. We can find particular files with something in it. Uh, now let's talk about you know important part of your quota. How much how much are you using? Um, and on, on Synet and many other Linux systems, there is a quota command. This one's actually fake. Uh, but we have it on Signet anyway. It'll give you a very brief description of where you're at at your usage. 
So it turns out you have 50 gigabytes in your home directory. Uh, I think we have a slide detailing the, the Synet systems a little bit more. You can have up to 20 terabyte in a different file system called Scratch. Um, there's limits on the number of files you can have. It's a million. Uh, and uh, you know, you can see how far how far I am. It, it's it's a snapshot, but it's important to know that there is even a limit on the number of files. This is uh, this is uncommon. That's not very usual on just vanilla Linux systems. You create as many as you want, and we really do this because if people start using this many files, um, the file system is very busy handling all these little files, and it's not good at it. Okay, so, so as the note says, this is part of the output of the quota command. If you want to know more, there's a command called disk usage. And it gives you, gives you a lot of information. So I, I, I have it here, and it gives you way... So this is only the top. So I can only really do this justice by doing it... Uh, let me back home to a little more. By making... A, by actually calling it. So this is the top part you already saw, and this gives, in addition to the stuff that um, Quota gives, namely my own usage, also the usage of the group, uh, because there's limits on the group usage too. Uh, for instance, you can have 80 terabytes in stretch and only 20 by yourself, so your whole group so you could have filled up the te 20, 80 terabytes and you can't write anymore. Uh, this can happen. Uh, and in addition, Terminal here. That's fine. It uh, now the reason we have this specialized utility is that it's actually quite expensive for all of you to start running du on your whole tree. So we do this as part of file service uh, uh, maintenance. Uh, every so often, every three hours, we update this data. So it's so if you're cleaning up, you say I just deleted. 10 terabytes of my scratch, how come it's still set? It's because it's three hours late. So it'll tell you exactly when it was updated, so you know. Um, it'll give you all the other possible options for disk usage. There's ways to make plots of your usage of scratch or home over the last week or so, and, 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 or month, or whatever time period you want. And, and then it gives you uh, some other interesting information, like um, what are the top directories with more than 1,000 files? Directory with a lot of files, as you saw, can get very slow with just doing an LS. Um, so you probably want to avoid this. And those are the ones you probably want to restructure, so you can figure them out very quickly. I happen to have two. Luckily, they're in uh, some sample code explaining how not to do things, so I expect those. Um, it'll tell you the directory with more than one gigabyte in it. That isn't necessarily bad, but it's just for you to know. So I have one that has uh, 65 gigabytes. Somebody I'm helping. Um, there's the results of the use case. Okay, fine. So, and something to do with, with, uh, with course. If this seems all where it should be, fine. If you're suddenly seeing, hey, there's this file or this directory that I wasn't expecting to have uh, 20 gigabytes in it, probably you made a mistake. Maybe you increased the output frequency. Maybe a log file grew out of control. And this is a good way to, to sort of track it. Okay, so you can monitor what's going on. Um, at a more detailed level, without having to go through a DU, which can take a long time if you really had uh, you know, direct use of thousands of files. So our example wasn't particularly good, and um, you can think about how it would be better, but without knowing what the project was, what the intent was of these files, we're really guessing, so we're going to go to the library and get the thesis and see what you know, what they were doing with this. But um, the best thing is to have a good naming scheme and directory structure from the start. Right? Despite all of these tools of trying to reconstruct what was what was there, it would have been much better if all of this was somehow encoded, if there was a, a file explaining what's what. Um, and you'll always need some tuning. It, it, it might get it. It's okay. Right? It doesn't have to be perfect from from the get go. Um, so you always be moving some stuff around, copying files, changing directories, copying whole directories. That's fine, right? 
Uh, keep in mind, the Linux command line doesn't have an undo function. You remove a whole directory, and it was by mistake. Tough. You told Linux to do it, it did it. Uh, now, if it's on home, on our home screen, system we have backups so you email us right away saying I accidentally removed everything in my home directory okay and we'll be able to get most of it back but this isn't in the we don't keep things for like years you can't say I want my home directory for two years back we have a couple of latest snapshots and that's it so it's for for to catch your mistakes essentially right but for scratch it's really hard to keep backups of 20 terabytes for everybody so basically we, we don't have that you remove a directory it's gone. So keep that in mind. Be careful. Um, this is uh, it's worth having uh, sort of being careful with these guys. Okay. So suppose that we were done. So okay. So we've we've, we've we're assuming we're, we've cleaned things up. I'm not going to go through that. It's too much work. Um, we've used all these utilities, and now we're done. Our project is gone, um, or our project is done for now. But well, maybe maybe in a week or so I have to come back to it, or in a month. Um, I want to keep all those files lying around, or maybe uh, I actually do want to keep them lying around, but I want to share them with somebody. Am I going to copy all of these thousands of files? So even if that that made sense to have these thousands of files, um, no, it probably doesn't make sense to transfer them one by one. Um, so you can you can pack them up, you can put them in a box, and in Linux that box is called a tar file. So tar is a command that packs files into a single file. And although most usages of TAR do not involve tape anymore, TAR actually stands for tape archiving. So, um, and you can imagine that that's, you're doing the same thing. If you're, if you're putting something on tape, you're basically just uh, dump, dumping files on there, and there, there's your tape, right? You're not accessing it. It goes on a shelf. That's the idea. Uh, it's not the only way you can use tape, but that's the concept, right? So TAR does a similar thing. It takes all these files and puts them in a big box. If you want to get these files, you'll have to unpack that tar file. Okay, so you now it's now harder for you to get a little piece out. Was there a question? Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, so you can still tar things if there's. Can you still tar directories? Yes, you can tar whole directories too. Is there like a size limit where? Uh, for for the regular Linux tar, there's not. Okay. Uh, or effectively, there's not. Um, for HPSS, if you're using that, there is a limit for some of the versions of the tar balls that you have. Um, but you know, in practice, there's no limit to how big they can be. Um, but they are linear. They're like a tape. Tape winds, right? So you want uh, the file on the last part of the tar ball. It will have to read the whole thing. So, uh, so you do this when you're done to sort of package things up. So you can tar. It's a bit of. It's a very old utility. It has, it has all kind of funniness in, in its syntax. But CF stands for create a file. Um, it's a file because I'm not sending it to tape. Um, that's actually still the default. If I don't say F, it will start looking for a tape to put it on. So you need F, and then right after F comes the file you want to put it in. So it's always called .tar. So I'm going to here uh, tar up the whole directory called previous. Previous was some former instance. I should probably know whether I should just delete it or not. Um, I don't know at this point because I didn't have good research data management in this uh, directory. But this is how we do it. I give it the directory name. Here's the file name. Now, now, now that it's tarred, I probably in between want to check that that thing actually exists. But suppose that it did. I can remove the whole directory. This is one of the more dangerous commands. I'm showing it anyway. Remove dash r f previous. R means recursive, it will go in the directory, delete everything. And F means uh, force, it means that even if you had set it such that it will ask for a confirmation before deleting anything, it will override it. So this is just, bam, gone as previous. This is one of those instances, very, very, very dangerous. So you do this only when you're sure. Yes, but you're Jamie. Because you like to make it Hey, I use it all the time. Oh, I use it all the time, but it is very dangerous. Now, now uh, often combined with tar, so once you've tarred it up, 
all this does really is take your files, concatenates them, and so there it is. It's different from a zip file, if you might be more familiar with, which also does compression. But it doesn't mean you cannot do compression. Uh, but there's a separate utility for that called gzip. And so with gzip, you can take the tar file and compress it. Compressing really means uh, taking the information there, finding whatever duplicate information is there, and stripping that out in a way that you can reconstruct the old version. Take out uh, blank space. Take out the blank space. Right. And so it will make things smaller. And so here's an example. So here's my previous star. I did an ls-l. I get the size here. You can see it's about 54 megs. And uh, there it is. And then I gzip it, and it became about 41 megs. Not great. So your mileage will vary on how much things compress. If it's binary data, this is actually pretty good. Uh, if it's text, it will compress much better. Um, typically, um, but it does. Now, I would say it doesn't hurt, but that's not entirely true. So this would help if you're really close to your quota, right? But if these are big tar files, doing this compression, it's a computation, okay? So it takes time. If it's big, maybe you're waiting for 15 minutes for this thing to compress. So you have to worry. You have to think about it. Is it, is it worth? compressing this or not. Like if, it, if you're not, if it's this much, it really doesn't help you much. It just costs you time. It's nice, but this is such a small, like if you're going to copy it over again, if it was much smaller, copying it over remotely over, over uh, the, the internet or something uh, would be faster. But if you're saving 10% or whatever it is, then is it worth waiting 15 minutes for it to compress or am I just going to copy it? So it's not, it's not always necessary. That's not my, my own thing. Now, there's ways to have tar called gzip and all of that, but I'll, I'll let you read the man page if, you're not, uh, if you want to know how to do that. Uh, but again, just because you can do it in one command doesn't make it faster. It's still doing a tar and then a gzip. Okay. Now, of course, sometimes you want to uncompress these things again, so there's g unzip and b unzip too. Uh, bzip too tends to be slightly better compression but sometimes slightly slower. Um, it's just a different algorithm, that's all. You could use zip and unzip too. They're, they're, they're there too, and that, that might be a little more friendly if you're going to look at it on a Windows machine. So for tarring, does it take as long to tar the file? Tarring files is really fast, oh, okay. yes. It's, just, it's basically as fast as reading a file and writing it again. And so that's, and the writing is actually very fast because it's one big file now. Reading could take a while, just depending on if you have a lot of little files and they're fragmented all over uh, different disks, it's going to take a while to, to, to do them. But that's, you know. And once it's in a tar, it is, it is nice and contained. So you could move it around. You could you probably put a little description there saying, hey, this a checksum. Yeah, compute a checksum. Put a checksum in a text file. And then in that text file also say, this tar ball contains this and that and the other. So you have proper uh, proper record and always keep those two together. Uh, that's a good way to go. Now, it might be a big tar ball, and you might have had this compressed. And so, what if you have a tar ball from six months ago, and you want to know if your file is in there, um, and you're not quite sure which tar ball was was the one that had your particular uh, scripts? because your naming convention wasn't perfect, or it could be, you know, it's okay, it's either one of this one or that one, but I still don't know which one it is. Uh, well, the only way to really find out is to uh, to untar it and, and to see. Any other question? Um, but you could sort of preempt it and say, okay, I might at some point want to know what's in my tarball. So I can't do a listing of tar, well, I can, but basically what I'm doing is I'm getting that tarball and I'm, I'm looking through the listing and I'm un unzipping it and, or at least uncompressing it to see what, what this is. So uh, there's a little utility that can help you keep track of stuff in your directories as well as your tarballs. Um, it's called ish. Um, so on Sinead, you just have ish, and so you can make an index of this, this tarball that we just created. Um, it's fairly quick. Let's see if I can do so. Tar. Do I have my tar already? No. Tar create file. Previous tar. Oh, 
I take a while, it seems like their house is not found. Yeah. The total power is there? About, yeah. It's not so bad that it's happened. We'll take it. It'll, it'll be done before before we're all gone here. Um, <laughs> but then after that I can I can make an, an index of that uh, of that tar. Um, and what it does is it, it, it creates basically a listing. It looks at all the files in there and puts them in a in yet another file, which now becomes a little bit long. It's called previous.tar.gz.igz. But that's because I tarred something, I gzipped it, and I made an, an index of it. And that, that index just for, uh, because it's actually a text, a text file of the listing, compresses really well. So it just gets gzipped again, so there's another gzip. And it puts it in, in a central directory in your home directory called dot is register. If you really don't like that name, you can change it, but that's the default. So from now on, you could look at what's in your tarball, like the names of files, their sizes, the dates, without having to open the tarball, without having the tarball. You can put the tarball on tape and just keep that index and you can see what's in it without reclaiming it from tape. Um, how do you do that? Well, you use ish again, but now you give it the name of that of that index file. Yes, it's long, but you know that's but it is unambiguous. It's whatever pertained to previous tar. And then uh, you can do things like ls. Now, in this case, I was only uh, so it, it it pretends like I've unpacked it, and I can just um, go through it as if it's a, a, a Unix file system. So I can ls things. I can cd into directories. I can find things, I can find all the shell scripts. Here's analysis one, two, three. And maybe I was looking for four. Now, no, this is not my tar, my tar wall. Let's look at the next one. I can do a du, uh, the output didn't fit anymore. But uh, so, it's, so all the metadata is there. I can't look at any of the files. So if any of these files said readme.txt, then that, I could still not read it. That's too bad, right? Because it's only the listing. Uh, but if my naming conventions are decent, I can learn a lot from just having that on record. Okay, how am I? Yeah, still going. Can you see ish dot zero dot nine nine something? Right. So when it when it starts, it just prints out some information. So this is version uh, zero nine nine seven. I think we have zero nine nine eight now. It somehow doesn't want to approach one, but that, <laughs> that's my fault. It's still in beta. Version one or two, yeah. <laughs> It's insecure. <laughs> <laughs> How do you um, untar? So if you un so tar is okay. That's a good question. Uh, so just as tar cf c stands for create. <laughs> if I did tar xf and don't, and don't give a directory, it was untar in that directory. Yeah. So x for extracts. Yeah. So c create x. Yeah. There's other options. Man tar will tell you all about it. Unless it, if there was a limit, in general there is the length of the tape. Right. Okay. Yes. You keep writing for as long as you have tape in it, and then it gets to the last foot, you will, we will choke, right? Yeah. So, so on the file on a large parallel file system, there is effectively no limit. Or, well, it's twenty terabytes, but you can't have more on scratch. But that's about right. Uh, but if you wanted to put it on tape. The tapes are finite, and so as a rule of thumb, if it gets beyond, well, what shall we say? If it gets anywhere close to 200 gigabytes, you're in trouble, right? Yeah, there's enough tape in there, but probably shouldn't use it. Yeah, and and it's not so so, but it's this is this is a balance of practicality. Like we get newer, bigger tapes, maybe the limit becomes 400 gigabytes. But think of 100 gigabytes. Okay, that should be a, a fair amount of have, having your tar ball. Now, if your data is already bigger than that. I mean, that's you, you know, how you deal with that is is a different issue. Right? Tapes are maybe not, or you have to cut it up anyway. And so, uh, another thing to mention. So we'll talk about HPSS towards the end a little bit, uh, and and how to deal with tape. But those are uh, so be reasonable. But because in, in principle we say uh, make large files and and don't have a lot of little files. But there is a a limit on what tapes can do because they are finite too. And so. Does a tar file represent one file? No, so the whole directory tree can be in there, right? Right, but 
Oh yeah, yeah, case. yes. It counts as one file. Okay. So it's a perfect way to reduce. Like, if you're done with a project, yeah. think, okay, I want to keep it because uh, next week or in a month I want to do it again, but I don't want to keep it as files. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tear it up. You can even do things like if it's if it's a small set but just many files, you can un untar it for a specific uh, job just to RAM disk, for instance. So if you have something that only takes eight gigabytes but it's you know a hundred thousand files. Uh, keep them in tar and just untar them on the fly to to RAM disk, which is very fast. RAM disk is like RAM, right? So it doesn't it doesn't hurt to have a lot of files there because it's 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 very fast. Um, so you can that could be a workflow too. Um, one more thing, just like when I mean I don't know if I'll end up doing this, but like let's say I have um, subjects, mm -hmm. like different subjects, and um, Instead of tarring the entire project folder, mm -hmm. and I just end up tarring the individual subjects, can I afterwards tar the entire directory? You can, yes. Yeah. You, you can have tar, tar files. In tar. Oh, it becomes a little harder to know what's in what, so you'd want to keep a, a good record of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would actually really strongly, if you do that, yes, tar up your subjects, create an index file of those before you put them in another tar. Because now the because the only way to get a listing out of the tarball is to start reading it, right? Uh, if you didn't make an index, but that index is at the start of the tar, so it's fairly fast. But now inside those are tar files, tarballs tar that I want listings of. Again, the only option I have is to completely untar everything, and that will take a while. Do people usually tar the entire folder? It's very common to do a tar. Yeah, well, it depends on the size. It also depends on what your unit is. Like if you're gonna, if you're only gonna need all these subjects all together, then it makes sense to just do it all together. But if you're gonna do sampling and you're gonna randomly pick twenty out of a thousand or something, then you, then the individual ones makes more sense. So it depends on your use case. I'm using the language of repository. A tarball can be considered an object. Bunch of stuff you can do with this. It has a help function. You can look at the wiki uh, on sign up too. Um, the code is on GitHub, so if you're running anything that has Bash, it should work. Um, you can do it on your own tarballs. You can do it on directories. Uh, yeah, that's, it, can be, it can be useful. So that's that's the set of sort of command line tools that that uh, can be very useful to find things back to uh, to help you determine if you have duplicates. Um, some of them hopefully at some point become completely uh, unnecessary because you've kept good records, but uh, yeah. still. Questions for this part? No? I have a question going back. Sure. Um, for file command, uh -huh. that's like the type of file, where does it actually get that from? Excellent question. As it, it's heuristic. I didn't really have to go back, I guess, but... Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, hey, yeah. finish. Yeah. So, but it, 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 it tries to be smart. So it, it, it reads a bit of the file, specifically a part of the, of, the, of the beginning, and tries to see if that fits some sort of pattern. So, for instance, if I... Uh, If I want to know where the, the ls command is, and I do that because I want a binary. Here's a binary. The file on binary ls will tell me, oh, it's an elf 64 lsb executable. The details are, but it's an executable. And it is because if I were so audacious to do a less on it, this is 
a big binary mess, but you do notice it says with big bold letters ELF at the beginning. And so it reads, I don't know, a couple, like 64 bytes or something like that, and says, is there a pattern there? Because most things in the beginning will give it a hint. And so, magic numbers, or magic numbers. Um, if it's a script, um, those typically start with like, start with something that gives away what kind of script they are. So this is a bash script, file tell. Oh, it's a born again shell script, text executable. Uh, by convention, it will always have the words text in it if it is text. If it's a script, it still will say something like script text or text command. Or, um, so if I had these, these in files, for instance, or no run in. That's just a plain text file, ASCII text, because it doesn't have anything particular. But it notices there's no special characters. Uh, all the bytes are, are within the range of, of printable characters. It's ASCII, so it's heuristics. Yeah. Um, when you were looking for that, for any scripts, you had a forward slash dot, dot script? Yes. Forward. Good question. And, and this, this is important using the find command. Uh, if I do this, what happens is uh, this is a command line in Bash, and Bash is very proactive and says, "I'm going to look for you uh, for all the, all the files that start that are of the parent stardust.sh." So it, it will look in the, but it only looks in the current directory. So Bash will fill will fill it, this out for me. We'll, we'll say we'll expand this to all the Dutch shells uh, that are in this directory. But find needs to look beyond that. So what is slash does is it basically tells Bash to leave this star alone and pass it on to find to to find in directory. So so another way to do this is put it in quotes. You unquote it. Um, if I didn't do that, what it would do is uh, this would actually translate in submit.sh analyze.h. So it will look like this to find, find things that it's this. And you're not allowed to have more than one argument to name, so it says syntax error, and essentially that's what it says. So whenever you give a pattern to, to find, the easiest thing is to put it in quotes. That way you can also look for things with spaces if you need to. Um, you shouldn't have spaces in your command line, but you could by doing this. Um, but yeah, that's what they're there. You're going to do a live for the whole afternoon talking about metadata. Metadata manipulation. Metadata operation. Metadata inspection. Metadata inspection. Metadata. 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 Um, the next part is about version control. So I'm going to close this. I'm going to give the, the floor to my channel. Okay. Okay. So it looks like you guys are familiar with version control, or at least some of you, right? So it will be just a quick review, but at least just to let you know about this tool, which is it is really convenient. People use in different contexts. Uh, you can use for developing code, for scripts, uh, uh, for papers. We use it for papers. We use for creating our slides for the lectures. Um, so it's up to you for what do you use it, but, but it truly is, is, is very, a very useful tool. Uh, Basically, it's a tool for managing change in a set of files. That's why you can use it either for writing papers or especially if you're writing papers in the, in the environment of Linux, like using LaTeX, which is a test-based 
uh, way to write the papers. Uh, so it's, it's easy to, to spot changes that different authors have done or, or um, resolve commits that people do while working together. Uh, if, you, if you use it in the context of developing code, it's a, way, it's a good way to figure out if you did a change and introduce a bug uh, when that bug was introduced and revert to the previous version that was working properly. Another thing that is useful for is for synchronize, is synchronizing data and ensure data integrity. We are going to see in particular a, a, a very fine-tuned tool uh, within Git for dealing with data. Initially, Git is not too good for dealing with data, especially if the data is in a binary format or a, a particular format that is not text. But there are some tools that allow you to actually um, accommodate and integrate data within the Git repository. What can you do or why do you want to use or would you like to use Git or, or version control? Git, I mentioned in Git, but it's just a particular software or version or code that allows you to do version control. Uh, the reason is collaborating. So imagine you're writing papers with, with colleagues or other groups. Uh, it's a very good way to keep everything under control and, and integrate all the different parts of the paper. Um, organization, it allows you to keep a very well organized and workflow of what you do, what you change, how the call, paper, or whatever you are working in uh, is changing in time. It allows you to track changes. We are going to see some of the basic stuff that you can actually do with version control. Uh, initially, because all of this, it allows you also to do faster development, reduce errors, and reprodu reproducibility which was one of, of the key points also in, in data management. How does it work? Well, it basically has uh, a repository, a main repository. And in this case, we are looking at a, a code, a development of a code, and two contributors to the repository. The nice thing is that the, from this central repository, repository, each of them can check out or, or take part of the code, uh, work on the code, work in different routines and different functions do the changes, and then commit back to the repository. If everything works well, people will be working in different parts, so they will not overlap. But even in the case that they will overlap, uh, there is an easy way to fix that. So Git will tell you when there are overlapping, when people work in the same part of the code or the paper, and how those changes affect the rest of the paper. Um, how does it work? Well, this main repository, or main client, as it's usually called, uh, keep track of all the changes that you do. So let's say that we have a grocery list or shopping list. And revision one of the shopping list is you add all the products or, or groceries that you need to buy okay, every time that you go to the supermarket. Uh, so my first item there is me. Uh, then I realize that I ran out of eggs, so I add eggs to that. So that will be my version two or, re or release two. Uh, and in that way, it's so this can be, in this shopping list, the items there, right? If it is a paper, it can be sections, it can be new parts of the paper that you are contributing. Uh, if it is a code, it can be new functionalities, it can be things that you are correcting or changing or modifying from your code. And revision one, revision two, revision three, the different stages of development of the paper or the code. Things can get a bit messy and more complicated. That is where actually the power of version control shows up. Uh, let's say that someone's check a revision of the shopping list again. Um, I can create a local copy, my working copy of the, of, the, of the list. I can change things. I can, if I, if I make a mistake or I didn't like how it looks like, I can revert the things. And then I can commit after my process of creation, modification, or change has happened. I can commit to the main trunk again. Okay? This uh, is also extrapolable for, for having a server, having a remote repository where people can contribute from different places, from different machines. So it's, it's again, this is one of the, of the most powerful things of, of Git. Any questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I have a question about, like, I, I don't know if this applies to all version control systems, but specifically for Git, what's the difference between pulling and checking out? Uh, it's a good question. So this comes to the point where you have a server. So when you are pulling, basically, you are you are requesting the current version of the latest version of the of the main or the origin or the master in the server, where you are checking out. Uh, I think in the case of the repository, the remote repository is kind of the same, right? Well, the, essentially, the checkout ha happens locally. Yeah. So 
one of the beauties of Git is that um, when you clone a repository, you have it so it's somewhere remote and then you clone it locally on your machine. Every version that there ever was of the code is now on your machine. You can go back as far as you need without having to contact the server. You can work on it, you can, you can do whatever you want, you can borrow all parts, whatever you want to do without having to contact that server until you're ready to do that. And so the checkout is when you say check out an old version, but it's already on your local machine. It's just somewhere in some hidden directory. So that's checking out, checking out your checkout versions. Pulling and pushing is, is the remote part. So I can pull back, say I made a change and I want to pull it back to the to the remote server, that's that, or push it back, or push it back. But I want to get the latest one. Somebody said, oh, I made a change, I put it on the server, I can pull it. So pull and push are remote actions. Checkout is local from a different version. Make sense? You won't be able to check out something like from the future if you want. Does someone commit after you pull the things from, from the Right, okay, gotcha. Um, so the version of controls that are mostly used. Uh, we, we kind of like the open source ones, of course, right? There are some commercial ones. I never use one commercial, but there are some. Uh, these are a bit older, Sud version, SVN, CPS. They are a bit simpler than, than Git, per se, because they don't have like this two-stage uh, or two-step uh, commit process. Basically, you change something and you say update, and that's it. I don't know if someone has used CPS or SVN. They are a bit more fluent somehow. Uh, the, the ones that people is using lately are Git and Mercurial. They are pretty much, they feel the same, they, they, are, they are very alike. Uh, Mercurial is, is developed in Python, so if you actually want to, to look at what it's doing, you, you could see uh, the source. Uh, then there are some web-based uh, interfaces like GitHub or Bitbucket. It's kind of the same idea. They are mostly based in Git, so it's just like a central repository if you want. Um, so there are different things that you probably need to do for starting with a, with a version control system. Um, as I say, we, these are like the commands that you use if you are dealing with Git, Mercurial, SVN, or CVS. Uh, the first thing that you first uh, order of business is to set up the version control system in your local computer. Uh, initialize the repository, commit your files, delete files, make changes, and of course, try to figure out where to get more information. Um, I just have a kind of a short description of how to install different versions of control in different OSs. So if you're dealing with Linux, probably depending on the version of Linux that you are using, uh, use one of the utilities for installing software like YAM, apt uh, and basically Git is there. In most of the, of the OSs, the Linux OSs, I, Git is already available for you. If you are dealing with Macs, if you get the slides, these are hyperlinks, so clicking whatever. So you, you can actually get Git from the Xcode, uh, that is the native development tool for, for Mac. Uh, if you use one of the Linux kind of uh, utilities to make it look similar, the OS to, to Linux, you can use Fink, MacBorse, or Homebrew, and again, you can get uh, it from there. And there is also a OS X installer for this, so any of these options will give you uh, Git. If you are using Windows, you probably will need to go into a mobile extern. I'm not sure if there is a native Windows utility there, maybe. I never use it yet. Right. But my suggestion is, if you're in this business, try to move as much as possible into Linux. Uh, it's where all these tools that Rancis was mentioning before are, are, are useful and more powerful. And a good way to start if you are using Windows is to start with this uh, emulator of Linux or interface uh, mobile extern. So some, some of the basic operations that uh, are kind of describing what we mentioned before, how to initialize a repository. Uh, what happens when you initialize a repository, depending when you are located in your, in your tree, in your directory, uh, it will create a hidden directory called .git in particular, or .ic if you're using Mercury. That, that hidden directory will have the old information of the track of the changes and, the, and tracking the changes that you are, that you are doing. So for initializing a repository within a path or within a directory, you just type git init, and that will create the repository for you. 
After that, the first things that you need to do is add the files. So it's git. And the way it works is always git, which is the command. And then there are subcommands or options. Git init was one. Add is for adding files. Uh, you can add dots, and it will add all the files and directories in that particular directory. Or you can add the specific files. And then for committing these changes, so I just add one file. If I want to commit this file into the repository per se, I just use git commit minus m. And the idea here is that you write a meaningful message. So this will create a log, a history of the changes that you have done. So it's very useful for you to have meaningful messages like, OK, I, I add my first file. But then if I change something in the algorithm that you're using to solve the differential equation, I just say something like that that is representative of the change that I did. So then when I look in the log and I want to go back to one version because it's not working anymore, I know where I did that exactly. Okay. If you want to delete files, git remove. Be aware that when you do git remove the file, it's going to delete the file also from the directory. Okay. You can come back if that file was in the repository, it was in the reversion control, you can recover it. But be aware that when you do git remove, you basically delete the file from the directory itself. Okay. Questions? Just to give you a flavor of, of this. Where are the repositories stored? The repository is in the same directory. So let's say that you are in um, home, um, my data. Uh, and I don't get it here. In the same directory, there will be a subdirectory now, my data. And if you look into there, there will be some subdirectories there, but the, basically the information is saved there. You shouldn't use VI to edit the files inside a dot V. Has anybody done that? Do you know we have what PI is? PI is an editor, it's a text. It's an editor. So you go there, start messing around, get, get really confused, and you don't know what to do anymore. Are you done that? <laughs> Looks like you have done it. <laughs> I have to reverse the path that other people did. Yeah. You don't oh. need to deal with that. So. <laughs> they deleted their files, so instead of going to the Git directory, using the Git interface to get the file back, they decided to go, oh, Inside this git, oh, that's my file. It's right there. They edit, they call, don't do it. No, no, don't do that. That's true. <laughs> so what git does, it git changes. It track changes of what you have done. And not necessarily it has to be in text format. So it, it, it does its own business. You don't need to worry about that. Just worry about how to interact with git. Okay? The other thing that you will notice is that when you use git, at least for the first time, in your home directory, it's going to create a, a file called git. It's basically where it says your username, your email. In the case that you are using a server, it's very useful because you can set to get notifications every time that someone changes something and commit to the central repository. So let's say you're working, you're working a paper, someone did a change, you get an email that someone changed what part of the paper. Okay. This is like extremely useful, really, really, uh, very useful. Any other questions? Once you start doing, it's much easier than what you see here if you hear about it for the first time. It's five minutes to learn how to use it and because, uh, get the hang of yeah. it. You're going to be using it all the time. You know? yeah. To be honest with you, it has a, a bit of a learning curve, right? It's mostly get used to the system. The other thing that you need to be aware is that the system keep tra uh, keep tracks of what you commit, of what you do. So if you modify something but you didn't commit that file to the system, it's not there. Okay, so it's kind of self-aware thing that you need to be aware of. Okay. Um, one thing I mentioned is so, or, or one thing that Git is not particularly efficient for is when you have large files or or, or binary files. Um, I think Rance is show an example of basically how a div. Did you show an example of the text files differ? Yeah, right? Yeah. So then basically what Git does is it, it, it show you that. When you change a version of your paper or your code, it show you how the how the files the files change. 
So if it is able to identify where they change, it will show you that. When you have binary data or large files, it's not so useful because it, it can be messy. If it is binary data, it basically will get confused. Uh, and in some cases, then, uh, when, when you are in that case, when you are in the case that you want actually to use a version control system for binary data or data itself, there is a something called Git Annex that basically uh, is built on top of Git but allow you to deal with those cases. The way it works is basically it keeps an index, something similar to what Rancid was mentioning with each as well, uh, but it basically don't change anything and don't commit the whole file of the file itself until you ask for it. Uh, if you want to think, this is a way to use or manage the metadata of the data using it. Okay. How many of you have heard about Git Annex before? That's good. Um, to me too. Oh, perfect. There you go. Can I have a question? Sure. Um, what's large file? What does large file mean? You have an idea? Otherwise, I mean, if it is binary, <laughs> it's going to have trouble independently of the size. Okay. okay. If it is binary data and you change something, it's going to tell you this is different. I had a conflict. That's, those are one of the cases where uh, Git is going to complain about a conflict. And in order to fix it, basically, you will have to remove the previous file. So, but in terms of yeah, so think, I mean, the, the, maybe, maybe a good way to think about it is, is suppose you did use this remotely. So you have your remote repository and a local one. Mm -hmm. uh, how long are you willing to wait for a pool? Right? If, if, if 50 megabytes takes too long to download for you to be comfortable with that, because remember, the binary files are typically outputs or input, but they're fixed, right? Typically, they're not something you edit, yeah, yeah. right? They're a fixed object. Whereas version control is for something that changes all the time that you develop. So, so the fit is, it already doesn't fit very well. Now, if it's a small one, if it's, say, 10 kilobytes, because it's a figure that you use, in your in your manuscripts, add it, sure, because it's it, it doesn't hurt. And if you don't change it, it only gets stored once, or actually twice. It gets stored once in the .git directory and once in your own working directory. So the inefficiency is a dual copy, but if it's 10 kilobytes, 50 kilobytes, you're okay, right? So it's more of what you can tolerate, but if you can tolerate transferring the file and storing that file, it will be okay. If you constantly change it, though, if it's a figure that gets changed because you have a script that Change. makes that figure, mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, you don't need the binary file because you can be created by that script, right? Uh, and so, so in that case, why would you? Uh, but yeah, that's uh, so. It's the binary one. It's not the binaryness that doesn't fit so well as the fact that this this is going to be more or less an immutable object and keeping track of its versions is. Um, so one of the things, or some of the things that Git Annex allow you to do is to drive these files with Git without storing the file itself in your in your local copies. Uh, so the way it works is uh, you start your Git repository as we did uh, we saw before, uh, and then you do Git Annex add, and by doing that you are adding the files that you you, you think that it will be interesting for you to keep. Um, git commit uh, basically creates a symbolic link to the file, not to the content, and that is where, where the magic comes into play. It's basically going to keep track of those links until you request uh, to get the file per se. So when you do git annex get, you are actually getting the file. You are requesting the file. Okay. It does some magic behind us. It synchronizes or try to do the, the movement of the data using rsync or wget. Uh, via SSH or HTTP, depending on how you configure it. Um, as, a, as a review, as I said, this is a very, very short review of, of version control. Uh, what version control allows you is to review differences between files in different commits. It allows you to go back to previous uh, versions if you, if you realize that something is not working anymore or you need something or you lost something in the, in the changes. Uh, something that is very interesting is branching, in particular for code development. So let's say people is working in different features of the code, 
and someone is working in an experimental setup of a solver and someone else is working in interpolation schemes or something, uh, you can branch out and then you can merge the branches when people is happy with what they have achieved. Uh, and this is interesting from all point of view when you try to reconcile someone did a change in the paper. Uh, I brought something, Rancy brought something else. We match and, and, and try to get uh, the best of both. I have some references and of course, uh, as I mentioned, there are some web-based options like GitHub and Bitbucket. That basically works exactly in the same ways as, as, as this. Oh, one more thing. So Git Annex has kind of an interface. It's called Git Annex Assistant. It, when you use that interface, it basically behaves as a Dropbox kind of thing. So all this magic of the symbolic links is gone. But it, it, it can be used in that way as well as you want. Yeah. Is there an efficient way of using Git with this in conjunction with Dropbox? If I have stuff in Dropbox and then it's just kind of doing like crappy version control. Doing its own version control yeah. versus I, doing, doing a Git. I mean, I, I'm not doing it because I, no, no, I, I, I gave up doing that. No, I, I just smiled because uh, we were doing a similar lecture last week and I got kind of a similar question if there was an easy way to use Git Annex with Bitbucket or okay, GitHub. I, I well, personally I mean, don't know. Uh, if, if the location of your Dropbox is the same on every system, okay. you could use symbolic links to that location. So rather than having your data file actually in your directory, you just have it a symbolic link to where it is in your Dropbox. Oh, I see. And then you'd have to add that symbolic link into Git. I see. And that would work. But if you clone it to another machine where the Dropbox is in a different location or your own directory has a different path, it breaks until yeah. you put in left another sim link. So it's it's a bit forced. Yeah, and another thing, but the sim link has to be within the directory where you create the, the repository. So if it is Levels above, it's not going to drag, it's going to be a, a broken link. Okay, so just bottom line is just don't get control. <laughs> I mean, yeah. No, well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. no. Fine, you'd, you'd want to, yeah, I mean, that, that file is, in, if you know that files in your Dropbox, then have your programs and scripts look for it in your Dropbox, right? And those scripts are in your Git repository. So yeah. you can make it work together, but it's, you don't make Git aware of the Dropbox. It is Especially yeah. recall that everything is in the version control if you commit it, right? If you add the file that you change and then commit to the version control. It doesn't do it automatically for you, right? Well, I was thinking like if I were doing Git inside Dropbox, so, for example, mm. so that, that, that's, a, that's a pretty bad situation. You want to just get the Dropbox and then it yeah. doesn't do what it wants to do. But that's, right. Yeah, yeah. no. That's, no. That's, that's in that, okay, so in that case, I, I know the stack issue, which is your, your, your reason for wanting to do that, but in that case, I would suggest to have like a, a, a server where you set up your version control system and then people can commit and, and do things like yeah, unilateral. Find a Dropbox with version control. There are service out there. Oh, no, I, I just essentially just started using GitHub instead. <laughs> 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 just no, that's kind another of wondering, because yeah, a lot yeah, of my yeah. stuff is doing Dropbox. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I want to move a folder, like, it doesn't matter where I move it on my system, because it has that, the Git folder Do you want inside. to move a folder within the tree where the version control lives? Under no, the basically like the parent folder, like the oh, contains okay. so everything. Oh, okay, so you can move that doesn't matter. as long as you move this directory with it. So if you move... Yeah, so if like, I have, like, uh, you know, my data. My data. Uh, new data. They are basically going to move the whole thing with the version control. I see, and Git has no problem with that. No. Any other questions? Oh, five points. So, want to do a break or? Yeah. How do you guys feel? Do you want a break or you're you're fine to go? I have a question. Yes. Yeah, sure. um, yeah. Is there a way that we could get an account that is private and not shared? Not in GitHub, but big bucket. Well, not unless you pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, Bitbucket works in a different way. So Bitbucket allows you up to six members, uh, including you, so five more collaborators. 
that may share a private uh, project, I think they call it. It's good to know. So it's, yeah, it's good to know. Yeah. It's basically the same, but they have this difference in, in how they manage the account. So let's let's talk a bit about file formats. Um, let me go ahead. So why we we want to to mention this? Well, um, basically the file is the way that you either use for a parameter file to run your simulation or your case study or to save the data from your analysis, right? So the way how you save it is important. As Francis was showing. Uh, an example before of, of data all put together in a directory without any kind of uh, meaningful way to identify it. Uh, it's, just, it's just plain bad, right? Uh, but on top of that is how you save that data. If it is ASCII, if it is text, uh, or if it is binary. As a, as a uh, suggestion, uh, not only for signage in particular, in particular on signage because the file system is a particular file system, it's a parallel file system that has to deal with thousands of users and, and several hard drives. Uh, but as in general, as a, as a suggestion, is not to keep the data in a flat directory structure. Just try to categorize in a sensible way uh, using subdirectories or, or different directories for saving that data. Um, parameters studies are cases where you can actually, for each parameter that you buy, you can create your own subdirectory for identifying the results. Uh, and as our mentioned before, keeping metadata associated with that data, with those runs, those simulations, those analyses that you perform is, is, is a very good suggestion. Um, so yeah, keep your data well organized. Uh, which are the formats that you can use for saving your data? Well, the, the traditional one or the simplest one is test or ASCII, right? Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of using ASCII as a file format. The advantage, kind of, is that uh, you can look at it. You can use the cat command. But that advantage goes away when you are dealing with terabytes or gigabytes of data. Believe me, you're not going to spot at your numbers there and try to see, oh, there's an anomaly there, right? You're going to do something like reading a, another program, visualize it, do something different. So that advantage is kind of gone when you're dealing with large data sets. It's portable, and this is kind of, hmm, depending on which systems you are. It has happened before that if you are using an editor in Windows and when you try to write uh, the files that you edit in, in Linux, it's full of strange characters as well, so, so, so. The disadvantage that for sure are going to hit you is it's inefficient because every time, in particular, if you are dealing with numbers, every time that you are saving the data, the machine doesn't know about text. It's all in binary data in the memory, right? So when you are saving the data, there is a conversion process that takes place. So it's inefficient from the compute point of view, but also it's inefficient in the way that it's storage. Uh, you lose precision with that conversion happens, and it's a slow for reading and writing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not the best idea. Of course, if you are developing your core for the first time and you are, you know, in the development process, it's okay. You 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 should do it, right? But when you're in production mode, it's, it's a strong suggestion to avoid. What other options you have? Well, you have like what is called plain binary or raw binary, which is just saving the data as it is allocated in memory in binary format. The disadvantage is you won't be able to look at it directly. It's like this uh, horrible thing that Francis showed with the less command, nothing there. Um, but it's going to be way more efficient for storage and for reading and writing that data. So there is no conversion there. There is no loss of precision, especially if you're dealing with numbers. Uh, the disadvantage is that sometimes it's not portable, depending. This happens very rarely. But if you are dealing with a machine like IBM Blue Sheen, which has a different way of encoding the data, and then you go to an x86 machine, uh, then you may run into trouble. Um, the other thing is that in some cases, you need to reverse engineer if you don't know the way that the data was saved. But if you are saving your own data, that is not a problem. Just for showing some numbers. So this is data set in, in text, ASCII, and data set in binary. This is in our file system, the parallel file system. It takes 173 seconds to save 128 megabytes of data versus six seconds saving the same data in binary. You can see the difference in the speed. If you were in RAM, so RAM, 
as you can notice here, it's roughly the same. And the reason is this conversion that happens. So the conversion is the one that takes much of the time here, uh, versus one second in binary. Again, no conversion happens, it's more efficient. Okay. Metadata, well, we, we talk a lot about metadata today. What is that metadata, those famous metadata works? One way to see is just data about your data. Which version of the code you use to produce the data that you are dealing with, um, if you were doing your own code, which parameters you use, uh, which release of the code you were running, uh, when did you run it, if you were compiling your code, which uh, flags did you use for, for compiling. If you were running on Signet, we have this module system, which modules were you running, were you using, in particular, which version of the modules. Uh, all what you can think that may affect the reproduction of the data that you are uh, generating should be there. Okay. Related to that is, so we saw the ways that we can say the data, text or binary, not recommended at all. Binary data a bit better, but then if you want to include the metadata with the data itself in the same file, which is something really nice, we have some standard formats that you can use, and it may depend on the discipline or the field that you are dealing with. Um, I have some examples here from different fields. One of the most used ones in science in general is NetCDF and HD5, which are the benefits of, of using these, these formats. Well, first of all, they are pretty easy to implement because most of them are, are accessible by using libraries. So you don't need to re reinvent anything. You just use a library and write to the file. You fill some files, uh, some fields, sorry, and just write to the file. They are self describing meaning that the metadata is going to be embedded in the file. It's going to be uh, binary agnostic, so it's, it's, it's an improvement related to the raw binary data because it doesn't depend on the, it won't depend on the architecture or the machine, so it can be portable to different machines. In many cases, this, this is very neat as well, it supports parallel I.O., so it will be even performs better when you're using a parallel file system. Uh, and in many, many cases, particularly in NetCDF and HD5, they have already visualizations built in for visualizing uh, the data that you are saving. So that thing of not being able to access or view or viewing your binary data is not there. Okay. So as an example, uh, let's take NetCDF. It stands for Network Common Data Format. Just to mention, it's not the same CDF format that NASA uses. That's a disclaimer there. The idea is that it's oriented for arrays. So basically, it says arrays. But then it says uh, metadata associated with this array. It stores the data in binary form, so it's, it's pretty efficient. Um, as I, I mentioned uh, before, this is independent of the machine, so it can be shared with different architectures. It says describing, and it has many wrappers for different languages like C, C, Fortran, Python, R, independently of, of what language are using, uh, you're using, probably will have a function or an or a interface that allows you to use. Uh, the, class, the classic data model for NetCDF is, uh, is, is mostly oriented for arrays or vectors. So you save your object, your array, and then you identify the type of the object, uh, like if it's a byte, short, integer, fold, double, whatever is your type. The dimensions that describe your object, and then attributes. Uh, which is supplementary information about those, those uh, objects. Uh, those attributes can be global or apply just to one of the variables. Um, you can put all the metadata as well there. As an example of the metadata that you can include for these objects are units that are really, really useful. So you're running your simulation or your analysis uh, using MKS system, and then you can choose whatever unit is, is the one that you're using. Um, there are many examples in, in climate and forecast, and all the conventions and units can be found. So it's, it's, it's pretty good for actually sharing data with your colleagues, so you don't need to worry about if I need to do conversions in my units or not. Another uh, well-known example of, of this binary self describing formats is HDFI, which stands for Hierarchical Data Form. It's pretty similar or built on top of NetCDF, NetCDF4 actually, uh, 
but the nice thing is that it was pretty much like a directory in Linux. So you can have not only arrays now, but all kind of values. And you can create this kind of three directories um, where you can accommodate and allocate all the different values. Um, I think that's all. <laughs> okay, we didn't put much about it. Yeah. In any way, so as a, as a summary for the file format section, uh, try to use binary formats, not text. That would help a lot in performance and in storage. Try to use the self describing uh, file formats, netcdf, hd5. Independently of the version or language that you use, C, uh, Fortran, Python, R, all of them have these wrappers for using those, those uh, functionalities. And yeah, NetCDF and HD files are one of the most commonly used formats in, in the uh, inside. Any questions about this? Who is familiar with these formats? I, you know, I know. <laughs> Anyone else from? No? Okay, more on time. So time to talk about the Linux and why um, Jamie and Razika created these nice tools like Quota and these users. One of the things of having to accommodate a thousand of users is that as you can imagine resources are limited. So we cannot allow anyone, everyone to have all the files that you want and all the data that you want because we will run out of, of this. So these are the uh, current limits on Signet. So in your home directory, you are allowed to have 50 gigabytes of files. Uh, in Scratch, you, have, you can have 20 terabytes and up to 1 million files. And in HPSS, it's 2 terabytes, but you should always say, me, you need more, right? Uh, there are some things that you need to be aware of. So home, as Francis mentioned, is backup. So if things are important or you, know, you need to have a backup, put them on home. The thing with home is that when you're running the shops, it's free only. So you cannot run shops from home. Okay? That is what the scratch is for. So when you need to run shops in the queue, in batch mode, they need to be run from the scratch data. Or at least generating the data, writing the data in the scratch directory. Uh, the other thing that you need to be aware of is that Whatever file you create in Scratch and hasn't been accessed or touched in the last three months is scheduled for deletion. It's not that we are going to delete it just without telling you anything. We are going to receive an email probably from Jamie saying, hey, dude, you didn't touch your files in the last three months. We are going to delete it because probably you didn't touch this because you don't need it. There are ways to avoid that, but just be aware of that. Okay? What else I didn't mention? Oh, the, the parallel file system that we have is, is it's an excellent file system for dealing with parallel shops, with dealing for parallel input and output rights, but it has its limitations, right? So that's why we suggest, and we have these limits, we don't, we don't want people writing or reading like hundreds of thousand files at the same time, because what happened there is that it's going to slow down the whole system. Okay, what you, you were noticing today, while Ramses was typing commands in the, in the console, is what happened when the file system is, is being exhausted. So as a conclusion or, or, or um, a suggestion is, try to avoid small files, and many of those, try to have like few big files, so that you don't need to, to be doing a lot of read and writing operations. Um, if you need to move data, uh, moving data that is less than 10 gigabytes can be done from the login nodes. Uh, the logins nodes are visible uh, from outside Signet, so login.signet.utoronto.ca, it's okay. You can use either SCP or rsync. Rsync is very, very nice because if the communication uh, breaks down, you can restart the, the process. If you are dealing with data that is more than 10 gigabytes, you probably want to use Data Mover 1, which has a bigger bandwidth, so you can move data faster. Uh, and it, they are especially designed for doing that. Um, basically, you need to start the transfer from Data Mover 1. So you need to be on Data Mover 1. Data Mover 1 is not visible from, from the outside, so the, day, the machine where you are Taking the data to or bringing the data from has to be, being, has to be uh, reachable from, uh, from the internet. Okay. An alternative to use this is to use GLOWS. Yeah. What does reachable mean? Uh, you need to basically have an IP 
where you can connect to that machine. And which machines have IP? Sorry? And in which situations do we have IP? I mean, when, when is it possible? Oh, Maybe well, basically. Yeah, so it, basically. If I'm outside university, is it sure? If I'm, let's say, at home. If you're home, you, you can sit down. You have, you have a way to get. Yeah. Uh, it's a dynamic IP, though. But, but mind you, if you're at home, 10 yeah. gigabytes or yeah. 1 gigabyte, it's not going to change much for you, probably. The connection, your connection is not going to be the same. Yeah. So, so for home, it doesn't probably matter. But if you still have to move more than 10 gigabytes, we have an alternative to that, and it's to use Globus. So Globus is a web-based tool for data transfer, and it has nice properties, because even if the connection goes down or it fails, it can restart late. Okay, so it doesn't matter where you are, you need to have a tiny program running on your computer, and that will take care of it. And it will work from home. Absolutely. And Globus will connect to Data Mover 1 and Data Mover 2. Anyway. Anyway, yes. <laughs> it's a secret way. Um, the other thing that, that it, it can be um, considered of movie data and is, is uh, related to the, to the topics of um, preserving the data, in the case that you consider that the data is useful and important for you, is to move into the hierarchical parallel storage system, which is a tape backup system. So if you are now dealing with a breakthrough result that you need for your thesis or your nature paper, uh, you probably want to keep that data safe and back up. So you probably want to back up that in the, in the HPSS system. Uh, you had initially two terabytes per group, uh, but as I said, if, if you need more, you can talk. Me or you? I don't know. Uh, I keep four slides. Yeah, yeah I keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions about this? This is basically moving data as a summary, SCP, RSync, Globus. We're going to see something more about Globus. And, and the tape system, the HPSS system. Um, we mentioned this a couple of times already. Many or all the uh, supercomputing centers around the world has uh, limits in the storage that they can allocate. And this is because they are dealing with, with a lot of users, right? Uh, these are just some suggestions. For Signet, it's 1 million files and two tera 20 terabytes on a scratch. Keep those numbers uh, on mind. Keep some of the tricks that Ryan is showing you, like the tar thingy. It has helped me a lot because sometimes I'm reaching the maximum file number. Uh, and if you tarp those files up, then you reduce your files. So that's, that's something new. Uh, try to reduce the commands like ls or du because those are very uh, picky and, and they try to transverse the whole directory structure for you. So if you, again, if you have many, many files, that will be slow. Uh, regularly check your this usage with this users or, or quota. Be uh, aware if you have more than 100,000 files, uh, an average file size is less than 100 megabytes. This comes in the category of small and tiny files. We don't like that. Okay? We prefer like big, less number of files but, but larger files. Um, yeah, and distinguish the different stage of your of your data analysis process. Too. You can. So this is how uh, HPSS looks like. It's a tape and archival resource. Uh, basically, you cannot access HPSS directly. You need to submit a shop in the same way that you submit shops in the in the batch system. You submit a shop for uh, tying your files and then passing that to the HPSS system. So basically, there is no direct access uh, unless that you do HSI. But basically, we have, that's how it works. Um, do we have, Shami, an idea when Globus is going to be working with HPSS? I already have it up, but I'm yeah, but quiet about it. OK. It's so it's just, it's just sometime it. soon, sometime soon, <laughs> this tool, which is Globus, uh, that basically looks like a, it's a GUI. It's a web interface GUI uh, that allows you to check files and move files between systems, either Compute Canada systems, the different consortia for super centers across the country, or between your computer and Signet, will also allow you to move data directly uh, from your computer or from your Signet account into the HPSS system. That's the magic that uh, Shane has been working. So that is going to be 
Maybe soon. soon. Okay. <laughs> what metadata associated all the stuff and the whole globe is there's going to be a publishing uh, interface with this. It's already available, it's just that we have not written enough instructions and defined enough use case so people can relate to it and they can say, oh, I can use that to put as a repository to put my data and my journals and my work, everything there. So this is all coming. So that we have a workshop on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah Shemi is going to do a workshop on that. No, for sure, but this is a, it's a very neat tool. As I say, the, on top of the graphic user interface, there are nice uh, things that are going on behind. So um, there is resilience in the, in the communication, meaning if something fails, it will restart automatically. You need just to have this uh, Globus Connect personal app running in your computer, and, and basically will do it for you. Uh, if you are doing things from different supercomputing centers, either in Compute Canada or other countries, it keeps going. Uh, it does uh, using several channels, so it's, it's faster, it's more efficient, uh, it's uh, encrypted, so it's, it's, it's all good. So it's a nice tool to keep in. However, it's still Unix underneath, so there's no chance for you to say to undo it or not to overwrite things or any of this. Once it goes, it goes. <laughs> Just be aware that in some cases, it overwrites. Yeah. That was the experiment we did last week. So, <laughs> but yeah. So, but initially it was as, as, as always, but with a graphic user interface, um, and you can have like you can check the status and if the transfer is, is going and how many channels it's using, and all those things, the statistics. Many of you will be used with what's new, the stuff that's coming pretty soon. That I'm going to explore a little bit more. Step one tab over there. Have you heard? And then I'm going to ask the both of you to come here and help with it as well. Figure out how to best use that one time. I'll be in the course, by the way. Dave, I'm talking to the office for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why I'm saying you're being recorded. <laughs> um, that's the stuff that the librarians like. <laughs> yeah, so this I have a hint that basically if you need to move data between machines, use SP or RSync. Um, yeah, usually the data is, is compressed, and um, if, if you compress the data and, and create arbors, it's better. Um, Globus, and then you have some information here. I think that's all what I have. Do you have sure. something else? No, that's it. Any, any questions? Oh, yeah, sure. Globus, how would you get a count on? Is it a For, so, you don't need to do anything special. I, the first thing that you need to do is, if you have a Compute Canada account, go here. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember, do you need to create something? No, no. So your Compute Canada account will work for Globus. Uh -huh. So right now it's still true that you, you have a separate Compute Canada account and a separate Signet account. And the password might not be the same for both, depending on how you set it up. This will change eventually, because it makes no sense, but it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, so Globus uses the Compute Canada one because it's a national service. Um, so even if you wanted to transfer something in the future from the GPC, which is at Sinet, to the HPSS, which is also at Sinet, you still have to log in with your Compute Canada account. Um, and then what happened? The, the, the next step that happens is that it's it's a it's basically a brokerage system. So that means that it doesn't transfer the files. It just tells the different sites to start transferring. So it will try say to sign that hey start transferring to the local machine so it'll give basically a signal to both but that means that well your local machine is fine you're already logged in you'd have to log in or authenticate with sign it again so the first time you do that you don't just log into the web interface with the compute Canada account you log into sign it with your sign it account now that last account login that's valid for a week so it's just something that that is done to prove that you're there. And the reason that that is really the case is that this brokerage goes through the US. This is a US service and shit. Nothing else but that those commands go through the US. Your files, well, they go through the internet, but they don't, they're not stored there. Your password doesn't go there. So it, that's why the local sites have to do that extra authentication. Just to make sure that nothing, nothing, there's no way that these Americans can get our stuff. 
Ik kan ook zo weer een keer kopen. Maar basically, hier zijn de instructies. Ik denk dat de abusers zijn hetzelfde. Ja, de abusers zijn hetzelfde. Het is gewoon het paspoort. Be aware dat in sommige gevallen is het voor je voor je Compute Canada paspoort. En in de andere gevallen, als je het doet in de handshaking, is het voor je China paspoort. Ze werken aan het uniformiseren. En de andere ding dat je moet weten, en dat ik denk ook beschrijf hier, is dat je moet hebben personal something something globus connect personal thing running your computer that's if you're transferring to your local like if you do it from, 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 from signet to to the systems in, in at mcgill you don't but this because as i said it's sending messages to the local sites you become a little local site at that point which only and in that case you will have to enter your signet account your mcgill account or hpc account right. Or right. 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 But those are valid for a while, so it's not like. Yeah. So you. Yeah. That's why this is like if you only have one thing to copy, this is kind of, kind of a bit of work to get done. But if you're copying every now and then, this just plays out. I already let him know about your complaint about Globus that doesn't select the star. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I remember. Thanks. Any other questions? Which department you come from? ECU. ECU? No, ECU. Uh, okay. You, 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 you.